All right, if you have a Bible tonight, let's turn to uh, John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Let me a couple of staples here, brother. This paper here has been ripped clear through. And here, I need, a, I need a couple of staples right there if you can get them for me. John chapter 15, we'll take John chapter 15, verse 25. John chapter 15, verse 25. On John 15, 25, that scene there in the upper room, the Lord Jesus Christ is talking to the disciples. And that's one of the longest passages in the Bible. Jesus Christ in the upper room uh, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke doesn't take much time with it. But when you get to John, he takes uh, uh, chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. He takes four chapters to talk about the last thing he wants to tell them. Is that is that a staple gun around anywhere, brother? Okay. And in the passage right there in chapter 15, he's telling them this. He's telling them about something's going to come to pass, and he said, this is going to come to pass, that it might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. And then he quotes the Old Testament. And he said, they hated me without a cause. That's the Lord Jesus Christ talking. He's not complaining. He doesn't have any persecution complex. He's telling the truth. <coughs> and the truth of the matter is, they did hate him. And they didn't have any cause for hating him, but they hated him anyway. And no man this earth was ever persecuted like Jesus Christ for what he did. The surest proof in this world that uh, something's wrong with mankind is the way they treated Jesus Christ. God sent one sinless man this world. They uh, made him guilty of capital punishment and then had him tortured to death practically before they killed him or tried to kill him. And the condemnation of this world is the judgment they handed out to Jesus Christ. The judgment they handed out to Jesus Christ was totally unjust. He didn't deserve it. And uh, a lot of people knew he didn't. For example, Pilate's wife, uh, she tells uh, she tells Pontius Pilate, I have nothing to do with this just man. I've suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Uh, Judas Iscariot said, I've betrayed the innocent blood. Uh, Pilate, uh, who prostituted his trust as a public official, uh, says three times, he says, I find no fault in him. Three times he says, I find no fault in him. And after saying three times, I find no fault in him, he has him crucified. So the condemnation of this world is the way this world treats an innocent man when he shows up. Now the big alibi around here for not accepting Christ is, well, the too many hypocrites in the church. Well, I just can't live it. When I get so I can live it, then I'm going to get saved, you know. And the ideas are that all these Christians are hypocrites. None of these Christians, you know, keep the Word of God and... I'm not going to get uh, saved till I can live it. That's, that's the alibi. But the truth of the matter is, God has already sent one sinless man to this world, and if you won't trust him, you're no good. And don't sit there and tell me you're waiting. The trouble is, is nobody, everybody lives like the devil. Jesus Christ didn't live like the devil. Why don't you trust him? You know, you don't trust him because you're no good yourself. That's your problem. I mean, if a man wanted to do good, God will give you a chance. And the condemnation of this world is that men love darkness rather than evil, uh, light, because their deeds are evil. And everyone that doeth evil hates the light, neither cometh to it, lest his deeds should be reproved. The uh, truth of the matter is, if you were a good man or a good woman and wanted to do good, the first thing you do would be trust a good man. And you can't deny that Jesus Christ was a good man. I mean, whatever you might find fault with me or your preacher or your deacons or your wife, your children, all that kind of stuff, there's one thing for sure sitting here tonight. You can't stand up and accuse Jesus Christ of sin. They couldn't in his day. In his day he said, which of you convinced me of sin? And nobody opened the mouth. So the, the trouble is, the trouble is that God sent one man in this world without sin, and you won't have him. And that shows something about you. That shows, it's very revealing about you. Uh, I used to preach on uh, chain gangs, real chain gangs. I mean, chain gangs. They, had, they were in chains. <laughs> and those fellows go to sleep at night. They'd run a bar down there between them, between the beds, and keep them on the bunks with a chain between them. And I preached out there, those big old black bucks there. Could you give me a couple right along? Give me a couple in here where this rip is, brother. All right, and preach on those fellows out there in the chain gang. 
they, what they do, they stand around a spike. They get four or five of them. They have these big old hammers with about a, oh, about a five-foot handle on them. And they get out there, and they would swing those hammers, and they'd sing. They hit those spikes, and the man who led the gang, he'd sing, Oh, Simon Peter, oh, Simon Peter, what kind of man this man called Jesus? And they'd sing, but he's all right, but he's all right, but he's all right. And they sing, but he's all right, uh, but he's all right, uh, but he's all right. Uh, and slap them spikes in. I've heard them out there, and I've seen them out there, you know, these old bucks, six feet five, six feet six, with whip marks in the back and razor slashes in the face. Some of them were out there in those chain gangs for coming home drunk and taking a little old baby and banging his head out against the wall. I'm nothing but the finest folk, you know. And I've seen them out there slapping those spikes in and singing, Oh, Simon Peter, oh, Simon Peter, what kind of man this man called Jesus? Well, he's all right. <clears throat> well, he's all right. <clears throat> well, he's all right. <clears throat> and I'm here to tell you he's all right. Amen. And the reason why you won't trust him and confess him is because you ain't. Amen. And that's all there is to it. If I was preaching the United Nations, I'd tell you the same thing. I could care less. I know. I know if a man's a good man, he'll trust him. And a fellow who won't trust him ain't a good man. You say, Rockman, what do you think you know? I got your number, fella. I got your number. I mean, maybe your wife don't, but I do. Maybe she don't know what to go with on the weekends. She don't have to know. I already know. Maybe it's something in the past you quit doing that you're trying to cover it up. Don't kid me. Maybe it's something out the future you ain't done yet, but you've got plans for. But if you wanted to cover the past and get rid of it and want to deliver right in the future, the first thing you do is trust Jesus Christ. And you ain't trusted him yet, some of you have you. You know why it is? Because you ain't worth shooting, fella. That's your problem. <laughs> have a nice day. <laughs> Smile, God loves you. <laughs> well, you know something, you know something. You can find somebody, you know, that killed your hound dog or move the property mark or bench mark or try to mess up your wife or your sister or your mother, but you can't accuse him of anything like that. You can't say Jesus Christ did that. There's not a man this bit could point a finger at Jesus Christ and say he would try to ruin your sister or ruin your wife. You say, well, I know a preacher that did this and did that. Yeah, you couldn't shock me with a shocking machine, man. Let me ask you something. What did he ever do? Yeah. Ever jip you out any money? Ever get you in a court of law, you know, and sue you unjustly? How about Jesus Christ? Let me ask you this. What did Jesus Christ ever do to you? When did he ever mistreat you? Can you, can you name a time anywhere in the, in, in, the, in the history of the universe where Jesus Christ ever did anything for you that do, you, you didn't have coming to you? Can you name time you ever tried to mess up your wife or mess up your daughter or mess up your sister or move the benchmark on the property line? Can you name a time like that? And if you can't name a time like that, then why don't you trust him? Now, I'm gonna, my subject tonight is this. I'm going to talk to you while tonight about uh, the subject of this verse. They hated me without a cause. You know what I'm going to prove tonight? I'm going to prove to you tonight that Christians at times take the same position toward Jesus Christ that the world takes. I want to prove to you that uh, sometimes we say people are guilty of showing our hatred for Jesus Christ. You say, oh, Brother Ruckman, I don't hate him, I love him. Yes, but you know something, if you love him, then a certain things are going to be true of the way you conduct yourself. And if you don't love him, there's going to be certain things true of the way you conduct yourself. And I hate to say it, and I hate to admit it, but there are times I'm one of his friends, I profess to be one of his friends at least, and there are times when we, and I say the first person uh, plural, there are times when we manifest a hatred for Jesus Christ as saved people. You say, what is that? It's the old nature. We have in us an old nature. I've been saved now for 43 years, and I have in me an old nature that does not love Jesus Christ. It's there. And if you don't know that, you don't know yourself too well. If you're saved, you have within you an old man, an old Adam that rebels against Jesus Christ and doesn't love Jesus Christ. And that old nature is in you. Now, maybe you don't recognize that. 
But if you've been living with yourself for a while and you're honest with yourself, after a while you will recognize it. Uh, I have something in me that rebels against the commandments of God. God don't have to go very far to show it to me. All God has to do is just do something I don't like. Did you ever have God cross your will? Did you ever go to the thing where you wanted to do this and God just did it that way? How did you take it? Pretty good? Did you run around the, run around the house on how you, glory to God, praise the Lord. <laughs> Listen, something, when that happens, that thing arises up in you and says, no, no, not that, anything but that. But God, what did I do to deserve that? That's that old man. Now, I'm going to talk about this text, and this text says, Hey, without a cause. And the first thing I want to say about this text is we show our hatred for Jesus Christ when we magnify the inconsistencies of Christians. We're all guilty of it. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't notice when a Christian's wrong. I'm not saying you have, shouldn't part company with a Christian when it's wrong. I'm not saying there's some things Christians do you can't tolerate and can't get along with and can't have fellowship. That's true. But this nitpicking, this thing about just Christian just delight to sit around and talk about the little faults of the brethren. They don't really amount to anything. They're just little things, and they just uh, they magnify them. I remember Tom was in a restaurant in Middletown, Ohio, and getting some breakfast, and a young lady was waiting on me. She turned out to be a charismatic Church of God, Assembly of God, or something with her, and uh, I was witness to her. I said, young lady, you saved? She said, no, I'm not. She said, but we don't allow laughter in our church. <laughs> I thought to myself, yeah, you probably allow them to go to sleep. <laughs> and she said, that is, no, we believe in three-quarter length sleeves. And I preached the gospel to her, and I said, you know about Christ dying for your sins? Yes. <laughs> you never <coughs> trust Him as your Savior? No. You said, but we don't believe in wearing makeup or jewelry. And after I tried to talk to her about receiving Christ, I guess for about 50 minutes while I was eating breakfast there, I finally got kind of put out with it. I said, you know something, young lady? For somebody that doesn't believe enough to get them saved, you sure believe a mess of junk. Yeah. I mean, that girl could write you out a list that long of what she believed, and she didn't believe enough to get her to heaven. Why are there kids in this building tonight that are nine years old believe enough to get them to heaven? Yes, Isn't that strange? That nitpicking. I mean, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. They don't laugh in our church. No, they go to sleep. <laughs> I mean, you know, in our church, you know, we don't believe the preacher should yell or raise his voice. I see. You believe in people getting saved? You always got these Pharisees always nitpicking, you know, and taking the, the little things. I remember one time down in our church we had a meet down there, and we had Bob Gray in to preach. And when Bob Gray comes in to preach, you know, one of those fellows, everybody shows up. I mean, every, every pastor is familiar with the fact that when he has visiting speakers in, uh, a lot of people show up that haven't been there for, you know, two or three years, and then they won't be back after the visiting speaker leaves. <laughs> we have people down in Pensacola say, well, Brother Upman, I, I, I don't think I should come to your church, but if Jack Hiles had a church here, I'd come to it. No, you probably wouldn't. Probably about the first time Jack Hiles pointed at you and said, Mother, take that baby out the door, you'd have a fit. You wouldn't be back in six weeks. But, they, but we, have, we have church tramps that kind of like to float around and get in on the, on, on the goodies, you know. And we have them down there, too. I mean, every year we have a blowout. We find some blood-sucking varmints coming in there that, that haven't been anywhere, supported nothing for years. But they love that cream right off the top, boy. Yeah. They know when the stuff's there, and they can't stay away from it. They're just not willing to pay the price to take care of it. Yeah. Getting real quiet here again. Only get quiet when you get talking about these things. <laughs> but it's the truth. And we had Bob Gray in for a meeting, and Bob Gray is a good preacher. He's a great preacher. Bob Gray, one of the few preachers in this country, preach over an hour and keep you awake. And he's preaching away, and uh, a fellow came there named Miller, Carl Miller. He's, a, uh, he's a, a medical doctor in Pensacola. And he wanted to kind of get a reputation for being a John R. Rice kind of a fellow, even though he was going to a Methodist church that supported, uh, you know, the National Council of Churches. And he was going to a Methodist church that supported the guerrilla fighters in South Africa, you know, and socialism and all this stuff. That's where he's putting his money. But he came around, taped Bob Gray, you know, and sat there in the front row every service and got the tape, you know, and the autograph and all that stuff, you know. And one night he wanted to take uh, Brother Gray out uh, for dinner. And Brother Gray said, well, I'll go out with you, but bring Brother Ruckman along, too. <laughs> and he didn't like that, you know. That kind of that kind of, that kind of crimped his style. But he had to, so he took us both out to eat. And we went out to eat someplace there in town. This was about 20 years ago. 
And there was one place we ate where you get all the chicken, fried chicken you could eat for $1.25. Now, now, when you say that to me, there's going to be a chicken graveyard. <laughs> Preachers like chicken because one of them sold on, one of them told on Simon Peter one time. They've been trying to get back at him ever since. And and I like, I, I can eat fried chicken for breakfast, for dinner, for supper, and dream about it at night. So I go in there and get me all the fried chicken I need for $1.25. Now, you understand this about 20 years ago. It cost you probably about $3 now, three fifty something like that. But I got in there, and Bob Gray ordered something else. And all the time we were eating, he kept looking at my plate. And he said, that chicken sure looks good. I wish I'd ordered chicken. And I had about, uh, I had about uh, two pieces of chicken left there in the basket. And I said, well, go on and eat those. I ain't going to eat them. So he ate them, you know, which, you know, kind of fudging a little bit, you know. I mean, if, if you did that, you know, one guy could come in and order one basket, and four people could eat out of it, you know. But you had just two pieces of chicken, a wing or something. So I said, go on, eat it. So he ate it. And you know something? After he left town, that doctor went all over that town saying, Brother, Gre Brother Bob Gray ruined his testimony. He ate two pieces of chicken he didn't pay for. <laughs> and listen, that guy was going around saying that was going to a liberal Methodist church and putting his money in a collection plate that supported communist guerrillas in South Africa. Yep. What about the fellow eating two pieces of chicken? <laughs> you know what that is? That's hatred without a cause. We, when we magnify the inconsistence of Christ's disciples, we reproach Jesus Christ. They're his disciples. They're his brethren. They're part of his body, bone is body. I know the Christians have their faults. I know you have to preach about the sins. I understand all that. But that little nitpicking stuff, that, that's a resentment. You say, I, just, I don't resent Jesus Christ, Brother Ruckman. I resent them. He that despises, despises not man, but God, Paul says over there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You start tearing the brethren apart like that, you're going to work on the Lord. They're part of his body. I mean, I, I get it all the time, you know, and you know me. I mean, i got a high, tough, and a rhinoceros man, but I know what's going on when they do. I mean, I'm in a home one time getting ready to eat chicken, you know, fried chicken. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, you know, and, and there's a little girl there at the table about six years old just staring at me and staring at me and staring at me. And her mother, after a while, you know, finally just says something has to be done, and she says, Honey, quit staring at Dr. Ruckman. That's rude. Stare at Dr. Ruckman that way. And she said, Well, Mama, when's he going to eat the bones? <laughs> and I said, Uh huh. The word got up and down the circuit that Ruckman eats chicken bone, you know. So they, and I do. I eat them. I eat them. I like them. I like them. I eat both ends off the drumsticks and both ends off the second joint, all that stuff. I like, I like chicken bones. But the little kid thought I had filed teeth, you know, going to breathe fire or something. He just <laughs> wait for him to eat the chicken bones. <laughs> I've gone out of a meeting. I've gone out of a meeting and had somebody later on say, Brother Ruckman cracked ice on the table, you know. Yeah, I did. I cracked ice on the table. I was eating the farmer, and he wanted to crack some ice. He cracked his ice on the table before he put it in the iced tea. So I cracked my ice on the table, you know. When Rome do, the Romans do. <laughs> But people are all upset, you know. I uh, Listen, here's a guy that attacks the King James Bible day and night and used to make a living with when he doesn't even believe it and worries about Brother Ruckman cracking ice on the table. You Pharisee, you gnat strainer. Strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. You know what that stuff is? That's an attack on Jesus Christ's disciples, and it's wrong. Now, there may be some big sin the Lord people commit. Sometimes you have to talk about them. Most of the time you don't. You have to preach against them many times if you're a child of God and a preacher, but you don't have to magnify the inconsistencies. There are certain little things about personality that are just, uh, just different. I'll give you a classic case. I'm preaching at uh, Key West, Florida, but I was preaching down there a couple of years, preached down there, and one time I preached down there, I had a real good meeting with a fella, and he didn't invite me back. And uh, that don't hurt my feelings. I haven't invited back a lot of places. But, but normally, normally, if the fellow's a Bible-believing fellow, we have a good meeting. He invites me back. And usually I get invited back every year. I get a regular after a schedule one after a while where I go to about uh, ten places every year. And this fellow believed the book and loved the Lord. And uh, we had a real good meeting. And it kind of surprised me. He didn't ask for another meeting. But I didn't say anything about it. I just let it go. And a couple of years went by. And then uh, finally one day, I was talking with some fellow who knew this fellow pretty well. 
And I said, uh, what about old brother so-and-so down in Key West? He and I were getting along real good, and I, I thought we'd have a good, some good more meetings down. They didn't invite me back in. I said, I always kind of wondered why. I said, do you know why? He said, yeah, I'll tell you why. I said, why? He said, because you ate your fingers with your egg. You ate your eggs with your fingers. <laughs> and I said, what? And he said, we had breakfast one morning in the past. You know, you sopped up your egg with your fingers, you know. Well, you know, I don't believe in wasting food. <laughs> and, I had, and I got me a little piece of biscuit thing, you know, or a piece of toast and mop up the egg and eat the egg, you know. I'm nothing to me. When, when it comes to culture, I'm out. I'm, I'm very class conscious. I've got no class, and folks are conscious of it. <laughs> anyway, I thought to myself, that's a strange thing. I felt it didn't strike me that way. And about two years later, the guy invited me back in for a meeting. And he invited me back in for a meeting. I got down there, and I called the egg thing to his attention. And he said, I didn't worry about that all, Brother Upton. He said, my wife did. My wife complained about it. I said, where is your wife? He said, she left me about a year ago. And I said, well, what happened? He said, well, right before she left me, she told me that three of my children weren't even mine. And he said, you didn't know if my wife stepped out on me about five times while I was pastoring here. And she was up before the church three times, repenting and getting right. They took her back three times. And the fourth time, she went off with my cousin. Now, she left me, and she's going to marry my cousin. And she just formed me three of my kids are his. That's the lady that was worried about the eggs. Good morning. Uh huh. Mm hmm. I know that bunch. I know that bunch. You know, the bunch of us, they magnify the inconsistency of the Lord's disciples. And when you do that, you know what you show indirectly? You show hatred for Jesus Christ. Oh, I'll tell you something else. Men show their hatred for Jesus Christ and they persecute disciples. Now, like I said the other night in my message, I don't repent of any of it. I, I don't know much about persecution, I've never really been persecuted. I've had a lot of things said about me, a lot of threats and stuff, but nothing big. And I mentioned the other night, Brother Roloff and Brother Vern Braun, Brother Popoff, these fellows who had some real persecution, and they do. But you know, the world shows its hatred for Jesus Christ for persecution sometimes in much more subtle ways than just, uh, you know, uh, cussing you or locking you up in jail or torturing you or taking you off to Siberia like they do in Russia or did in Russia and that kind of thing. Sometimes they show it much more subtle ways, you know, for example, I remember when, one time I was preaching at a camp down in Camp Swanee, a little old camp down in Florida, and I had my boy with me there, David, when he was about, always oh, about 11 years old. And I remember one time, and I've seen this before in a congregation, one time uh, I was given an invitation down there, and I saw David turn around and witness to a boy right behind him, a boy about 14, and he turned around and said something, and from where I was standing, I could see that boy about 14 do like this. See? And my boy turned back around. Uh, what he was threatened to do there was to beat him up if he didn't shut up. That's a little thing, see? It's a little thing, but it shows kind of stuff that goes on. Uh, you take the world, it has its way of doing these things. You take every year on, uh, every year on uh, television now, for year after year after year, including this year, they're showing the Holocaust, the Holocaust, the Holocaust, the Holocaust. Hitler, 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 Hitler. You'll see when you go home tonight. World War II, over and over and over, German concentration camps. Oh, this terrible German. Why, listen, in the Gulag Archipelago, you can find them on the back of that thing, the concentration camps in Russia that are there, the 110 of them. Hitler had 20 of them. Old Uncle Joe Stalin has you set up five times as many as Adolf Hitler, and nobody opened their mouth. Isn't that a strange thing? Isn't that a strange thing? They have what they call, you know, on, the, on the television and radio, supposedly a law for equal time. And the idea is you're supposed to get equal time to present your side if anybody says anything wrong about you. And that way they got rid of all the attacks on the modernists and liberals because you couldn't speak against them because if you spoke against them, you had to buy them equal time to speak against you. And they weren't even around there. And the radio station wouldn't want to put up with all that stuff anyway with the FCC, so it just puts you off the air. But you take, you don't have any equal time laws in America. The saved people in America, talking about this election coming up, the saved people in America, they don't, 
They don't have any right to speak up for what they believe. The parts they don't like, brother. You know what that is? It's opposition. And the same way with Christians. They didn't give Roloff a break on television. They didn't give Herman Fountain a break on television. We had a fellow up there in Nebraska named Sullivan that was arrested, and his family was under arrest, and the women had to leave the state to keep him getting arrested, and his deacon was locked up, and he was held without bail for just running a Christian school and not co to the Department of Education. Well, that is, what, what that is, you know what that is? That's hatred for Jesus Christ. That is no. Men show their hatred for Jesus Christ by the fact they try to disprove the Bible. Every time you find some fellow standing up there trying to prove this passage isn't in the original and that passage isn't in the original and this couldn't have been here and this is a contradiction here, you're dealing with men who hate Jesus Christ. And that's how they show their hatred. I'm, you know what Christ said about that book? He says, sanctify them of the truth. Thy word is truth. If thy word is truth and a man's against that word, he's against Jesus Christ. Back in the old days, the infidels would get up there and they'd charge something like $8,000 a night Fellows like Ingersoll and that bunch to stand up and attack the, the Bible. When they get through, sometimes an old infant will come around and say, Bob, I hope you're sure I'm right. I'm counting on you being right. And he paid $1,000, you know, to hear that fellow for one night, those crowds. Why, you have infidels today in Christian schools that are turning out infidels, and they're not making $800 a week. They're a fool and a rascal in one compound. You want to know what's wrong with the United States? I mean, all the way. Of course, we could talk about all kinds of things being wrong. And the brother talked about some things wrong here just a while ago. You know what the main thing wrong with the United States is? The thing that's wrong with Germany, Austria, and Spain, Italy, and Russia, and China, and Japan. It's the book has gone. The authority of the book is gone. And our Sunday school literature is turning out infidels. The Sunday school literature. This verse should be this. This verse should be this. This isn't right here. You're raising a nation of infidels, a bunch of unsaved people. And those people who spend their time trying to prove the Word of God is not the Word of God, has mistakes in it, and contradicts in it, and lies in it, and myths and legends, those people hate Jesus Christ. And you as a child of God take their side or go along with them, in a, in a sense, you manifest a hate for Jesus Christ too. You know, folks say... Five fat people say to me, say, well, what about this in the Bible? What about that in the Bible? I know there's a lot in the Bible hard to understand. Nobody knows that any better than I do. You've never seen my second volume of the Minor Prophets, have you? You never will either. <laughs> I mean, I've got the first volume of Minor Prophets, and I stopped at uh, Zechariah, and I can't go any further. You say, why? I don't know what I'm reading. <laughs> so you mean something in the Bible you don't understand? All kind of stuff I don't understand in there. I could bluff my way through. I give me a commentary and say, so and so is this, so and so is this, and you can take your pick. But Zechariah? I've been through Zechariah 129 times. I don't know what he's talking about. And I saw these four riders in the, in the, in the bottom among the myrtle trees on speckled and red and white horses, speckled and spotted. And he said, this, these black horses from the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. What is that? <laughs> like a fellow said, that can only mean one thing, and I haven't got an idea in the world what it means. <laughs> I don't know what it means. I get the Song of Solomon. I, I, I've got commentaries in all four of the wisdom books, but there are five of them. I just finished the commentary on Ecclesiastes, and I've already got one of the Psalms in Proverbs and got one on Job. You say, when does the Song of Solomon come out? Never. <laughs> you say, why? I don't know what he's talking about. What should we do for our sister in the day she's she spoken thereof? Well, if she's a wall, we'll enclose her with cedar. And if she's a door, come on, man. Your sister's a door or a wall, and you're going to lock her up in cedar? I don't know what I'm reading. I don't know what I'm reading. I don't got any idea what I'm reading. Folks said, doesn't that bother you? No, it don't bother me. Sam Jones said, if I understood all the Bible, I'd know somebody who wrote it didn't have any more sense than I did. Amen. I mean, I expect that book to have things in it like that. Like one time on a train, an infidel was sitting opposite a young preacher going off to ministerial school, and he said to the young preacher, uh, I see you read the Bible. He said, yes, I do. He said, you understand everything in it, do you? He said, uh, no, no matter of fact, I don't. And he said, what do you with the parts that you don't understand? And the young preacher said, well, I do it just like I do, and I eat chicken. I just eat what I can and leave the bones in the plate for some other fool to choke on. <laughs> and that's what to do. That's what to do. 
I like that Salvation Army girl said the one time, you know, to a fellow, she said, I believe the Bible. He said, you don't believe that story about Jonah and the whale, do you? She said, of course I do. He said, well, he couldn't have gotten that whale. And she said, well, I know he did get in that whale. When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask him. And the infidel said, what if he's not in heaven? And she said, all right, then you ask him. <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's good enough. That's good enough. That's good enough. I mean, why should I, listen, why should I bug myself about something I don't understand when I don't understand how the light turns on? You should bother up in electricity. Oh, don't give me that stuff. I, I've sat around and heard these scientists talk. I've had a guy sit for an hour and try to explain a dry cell battery to me. And when he got where he couldn't understand it, he said magnetism. When he hit it again where he couldn't understand it, he said gravity. And the next time, what is gravity and magnetism? Well, who on earth knows? All you know is the way they work. You don't, know how, you, don't, you know what the thing is. You put a name on it. This is a meson. This is a quasar. This is a quark. This is a spook and a kook and a... Now, that's what this thing here is. I mean, all you're doing is putting names on that stuff because you don't understand it. You take, you, take, you take Sunday morning, you know what I'm, or Monday morning, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going down there, Lord willing. Lord willing, I'm going to go down there, get in the airplane, and fly back to Pensacola, and I'll get in that big old buzzard, and he'll get up there and crank up the end of the runway and take off. He'll take off with, you know, 80, 90 people on him, and about uh, each one of them carrying about 100 pounds of baggage, which they shouldn't be doing, but they do. When he lands, he lands like a flying boxcar, banging the ground with all that weight in it. But you take that bourbon, he takes off the ground. He can't get off the ground. How do you take 10 tons and pick it up off the ground? But they do it. You get in there and whoosh, up he goes. You say, well, Brother Ruckman, the aerodot, I know all about that. And the wind flow over the top of the wing and at the bottom of the wing and cry, all about that stuff, okay? The truth is, I can't explain it, but I ride them, I ride them eight times a month. It goes. Do you think I'm going to wear my head about something that Bible I don't understand? I'll just keep reading it till I get what I need. I do need to understand. What I need to understand, God will show me. All right, men show their hatred for Jesus Christ. I'll tell you another way they do it. They show their hatred for Jesus Christ by trying to rob him of his glory in Bible revision. They make these Bible versions to rob him of his glory. There isn't one of these so-called new Bibles in the market that doesn't take a poke at Jesus Christ somewhere. I mean, any of them. And folks say, what about that New King James? It does the same thing too. If you've got a New King James Bible, look at that New King James Bible over there in Acts chapter 4, verse 27. It will say, Thy holy servant, Jesus, and your King James Bible says, Thy holy child, Jesus. Yep. Why, you know what that is? That's a bunch of fellows sitting around showing their hatred for Jesus Christ. Oh, no, Brother Ruckman, these were godly men. How could you say about these godly men? Listen, David was a godly man. But you, can, you couldn't trust him with, his, with your wife while, he was, while you were overseas. <laughs> I mean, these fellows, I get so tired of the, the godly men, the godly, godly, godly. And this godly doctor, he recommended this version. What about this godly fellow? He recommended that. That doesn't mean it's right. That doesn't mean it's right. And so, brother, what this person is godly? I'm glad they are godly. But when they recommend something else, they're being ungodly. <laughs> I mean, somebody said, well, they're, they're, they're godly fellows. Well, so was Noah. The Bible said he was a preacher of righteousness, but he got drunk. These fellows say, well, these new Bibles have all the fundamentals in them somewhere. What's that got to do with it? I mean, I can find a, I can find a dollar bill in a sewer. That don't make it a bank. Did you know you can find a diamond ring in a garbage can? That doesn't mean it's a jewelry store. You can find all the fundamentals in these Bibles. Hey, man, you can find all the fundamentals in a theology book. But it's not a Bible. The living Bible. The living Bible. Reading the living Bible is like shaving with a banana. <laughs> the NIV, the nutty idiots version. <laughs> all, all this stuff, all this stuff, attacking, trying to rob Jesus Christ of his glory. Oh, they say, well, you know, that the funny, you can find the fundamentals in there somewhere. That doesn't mean a thing. You take those books. Did you know you, there's only one English Bible left in this continent that you can find that tells you to study it? The word study in regard to the Bible occurs one time in the Bible. It occurs in 2 Timothy 2.15. And if you don't have a King James Bible, you haven't got that verse in your Bible. 
You don't believe me? Go down to the bookstore and check them out. Just lay them right out. Berkeley, Moffat, Weymouth, Goodspeed, Phillips, Centennial, New English Bible, New World Translation, Riverside, ASV, RSV, New ASV, Moffat, RV, NIV, Calvin and Hobbes, Hagar, <laughs> the, terrible, the Wizard of Id, Croc, Peanuts, you know, the, and lay that stuff out. There's only one Bible that says study to show yourself approved to God. It's a King James. Now, don't tell me a godly man took that word out there. What godly man would take out the only commandment for you to study that book? I know who would take that thing out. You say who? An enemy of Jesus Christ. What would take that thing out? You, what you drawing there, Ruckman? You know what I'm drawing. That Bible says, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastening of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, laid on him, laid on him, the iniquity of us all. Now I know I'm saved. How do I know I'm saved? I know I'm saved because my sins were laid on Jesus Christ. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, whatever is not of faith is sin, sin is the transgression of the law, a high look and a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked is sin. John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And when we do these things I'm talking about, we save people. You know what we do in a sense? In a sense, we're manifesting our hatred for the one that bore our sins. I don't want to be included in that number. If I can get around it, I'll find somebody to get around it. I'm one of his friends. I don't profess to be one of his enemies. All right, that isn't all. You know how men show their hatred for Jesus Christ? They show their hatred for Jesus Christ when they rejoice at the fall of a disciple. I, mean, I know exactly what I'm saying. You take Nathan when he comes to David. You know what Nathan says to David? He said to David, he said, because of this thing, you've given the enemies of the Lord. Did you get that? The enemies of the Lord, great occasion to rejoice, to blaspheme. He said, David, because you do this thing, you cause God enemies. You, got, you, you gave them a break. Now they can raise Cain and point the finger at you. And they've been doing it. I mean, for 2,000 years, they've been talking about the sin of David and Bathsheba. Made a movie about it. Made a movie about it. You know who made that movie? His enemies. And when a Christian gets in bad trouble, and sometimes Christians get in bad trouble, and you find other Christians rejoicing in it and bragging about it and talking about it, you're dealing with his enemies. Recently, Jack Hiles got some trouble, and his son got some trouble or something. We got a fellow up in somewhere. He's been on the shelf about 30 years, I guess. I call him Bobby Scumner. He prints the Christian Inquirer, the Christian Midnight or something. <laughs> And he puts, out, he puts out a thing there about 22 pages about Jack Hyle's sin or the sin of his son or something or other. I don't go for that stuff. I don't buy that stuff. I never have been a special promoter of Jack Hyle's. He's never invited me there for a meeting. I don't even know him personally. I never met him. But I sure wouldn't waste paper, that much paper, anybody sends. I'm sure some of you buy my stuff. I've got 115 books, some of them 600 pages. You won't find three pages in 115 books dealing with any Christian's personal sins. They're not there. You say, why? They've got no business being there. You know, years ago when I first began to preach, I was a young fellow and a brand new evangelist from just starting out. I had high hopes of being accepted by the powers that be. <laughs> and I hadn't preached more than about two churches and one of the fellows, one of the leading lights in the Bible Baptist Fellowship, wrote out 400 letters on me and sent them out all over the country to all the pastors saying, this man is not a Baptist, this man is not one of us, don't invite him in for a meeting. And I thought I was, I thought my water was cut off for good, brother. I thought I was through. And that fellow went on down, he was a pastor down in Jacksonville. And a bit later he got in some bad trouble. And a woman shot him. And it got out in the police gazette, you know, and the true detective and a real detective and, you know, crime magazine and stuff, you know, and all stuff like that. And she shot him and murdered him. And uh, a fellow phoned me up over the telephone. And he said, uh, do you hear what happened to so-and-so down in uh, Florida? I said, yeah. He said, boy, God sure vindicated you, didn't he? 
I said, what do you mean? He said, wasn't he that fellow wrote out those letters about you all over the country? I said, yeah. He said, boy, I bet you're sure glad he got what was coming to him, aren't you? I said, no, not particular. No, I'm not particular. Why? He said, well, he was caught right in the act. I said, how do you know he was? He said, well, she shot him right in the front yard. I said, what'd she shoot him for? Well, they've been shacking up together. I said, in that case, he must have been trying to quit. You go kid your mother, okay? Don't kid me. I know human nature better than that. I mean, if she did that, it's probably because he's about to bust things off. You said, well, still a bad thing. Sure, it was a bad thing, but why glory in it? Why talk about it? Why brag about it? Why, why spread that stuff around unless you're just the fact that you yourself are just kind of fouled up yourself, you know? You can use that to kind of justify what you're doing. Yes, I've seen these Christians. Boy, have I seen these Christians talking about, oh, brother, up, and if you just knew about so-and-so and I know about so-and-so, I knew more about so-and-so you know about if you lived be 40 more years, man. Listen, a fellow been out in the field like I have for 43 years, what do you suppose I've seen? Maybe I'll look stupid and talk stupid, but brother, when you've been in 700 local churches, in seven, for 43, man, what have you seen? <laughs> you couldn't shock me with a shocking machine. If I heard tonight that, uh, that Jack Hyle shot Bob Jones Jr.'s mother, I wouldn't even take a baby aspirin, man. It'd mean nothing to me. I'm mean, after a while, you get immune to it. I'm up there in Michigan one time. lady says to me, Brother Up, and I've just got to leave this church I'm going to. I said, I think you're making a mistake. I said, I know you're a pastor, and he's a soul winner, and he believes the book, and he's a fine fellow. I think you could do a lot worse. She said, well, Brother Upman, if you just knew about that preacher, but I know about that preacher. I said, lady, if I knew everything about you, God knows about you, I'd puke. <laughs> and she, she didn't laugh at all, you know, no sense of humor. <laughs> it's strange how these folks are. Well, Ruckman, just let me tell you something. You ain't going to tell me nothing. I have come, I have gotten out of planes and going to take a meet and have the guy drive me to the meet and show me a clipping where the guy that led the singing for me the last year was in jail for beating up a cop. And he beat up the cops who came to arrest his wife because his wife, who ran the choir, was running a cat house in the church, and the call girls were the choir. <laughs> in an independent, premillennial, fundamental, Bible-believing, Baptist church. <laughs> I had a meet one time out there in, the, in, in San Diego, and two guys met me out outside of my motel one night, and they said, we got a question for you. I said, well, go ahead. They said, we heard you can answer any question in five seconds or less from the Bible. I said, well, sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. I said, only about a thousand, but I'll try. And they said, well, here's a question. They said, what if you go into a church and your little girl came to you and talked to you and convinced you that the pastor had been molesting her, your eight-year-old girl? And then you got a report that from several other families that their little girl said the same thing. What would you do? They'll put them on you, won't they? Well, they'll put them on you. And I said, well, and quoted to Matthew chapter 18, you know. I said, the first thing I'd do is go to him personally and talk with him. And I said, when I'd go, I'd take my little girl with me. And I'd have my little girl sit there, and I'd have her go through what she told me in front of him. And if I found my little girl was lying, I'd beat her britches. I mean, little girls are lie sometimes. you know that? Did you know that? Yep. The lie. The lie to you. Little boys, little girls, the lie. Somebody want attention, they'll find a way to get it. They'll lie. And I said, if I thought my little girl was telling the truth, I said, I'd get out of that church and I'd never darken that door again. I'd get out quick and I wouldn't come back. And he said, would you turn the fella in? I said, no, I don't think I'd get involved in that. And he said, why not? I said, you just open a can of worms. You'll have to prove this stuff. And your little girl will get dragged in it. You may ruin her for life. I said, I'd, I'd just pull out, stay out. And then one of them said, well, Brother Ruckman, he said, what if you live in a state that had a law and that law said that if you knew of such a thing as we're talking about and didn't report it, that you were an accessory after the fact and somebody could get you. And I gave him Romans 13, 1 to 3, and said, well, I guess as far as living in the state would have that law, I guess I'd have to obey that law. But I said, I sure wouldn't want to. And I said, even that law being what it is these days, I don't know if I'd go by a law like that, you know. I mean, Martin Luther King got by with civil disobedience. <laughs> and I said, uh, I, don't, I still don't think I'd drag a little girl into it. And they said, okay, and dropped it. And they dropped it. 
And then after they dropped it, I went on about my circuit, you know, and went on a couple more meetings. And boy, about two months later, I read in the paper, this guy, this meeting in San Diego, they'd arrested him, and they arrested him on 18 counts of child molestation. And they convicted him on eight of them. And they sent him off to San Quentin. Now listen, that fella was born again, just as born again as anyone in this building. And don't, don't kid me now. You go kid your grandmother. You people sitting right now drawing judgment and saying, well, I wouldn't do a thing like that. Your problem is self-righteousness. And your problem is you don't know how bad you could get under the right circumstances or the right opportunity because you've never really been tried. That's your problem. Now listen, Christian, Christian, just stay out of church four or five months. Just put up your Bible for four or five months. Just quit praying a few months and just watch how far you can go. You go so far, turn your hair gray. You know what I've heard of since I've been saved? I've heard of saved people, saved people, saved people, just saved as you are, doing everything I've heard of unsaved people doing, I think with the exception of a sex murder, with the exception of murdering somebody for a sexual thrill, I don't believe I've ever run to a born-again Christian who was involved in that. But short of that, everything else, and it might have been that. We had to ship a guy in our school one time for a uh, child molesting. One time he preached out in the street, we got King James Bob from cover to cover. We call him in, the law was after him, they're going to get him too. And I called him and talked to that fellow and talked what he did. He was stripping in front of a bunch of little old kids, four and five years old. You know, that's a weird thing. You know what? I thought he'd get messing sexually with kids four and five and six years old. Brother, you've got to be more than demon possessed to do that. Yeah. You've got to have something up here, boy, yeah. that's just completely off, man. Yeah. And we talked to that fellow and talked to that fellow, and he, you know, he talked with us. And I finally asked him, I said, uh, this was your next door neighbor, wasn't it? He said, yep. I said, let me ask you something. I said, how long ago has this been? He said, well, it's been about five months now. And he said, the law is involved, and I've been tried one time, coming up for another one, they're going to have the trial, I'm out here on, you know, on bail, and they're going to sentence me. And I said, let me ask you something. In that five months, I said, have you written to this next door neighbor of yours yet and told him that you're a Christian and asked him to forgive you for living like the devil and tell him you're sorry for your sins? He said, no, I haven't. I said, why not? He said, my lawyer told me not to have any contact with him. And I said, the law be hanged, buddy. I said, if you're saved, you owe that to that fellow personally. And then he kept on talking and talking. And finally I said to him, I said, you know what bothers me about you? And he said, what's that? I said, we've been sitting here talking for an hour and a half, and I haven't heard you say yet that you wanted to stop doing those things. So you make me nervous. And that fellow said, well, began to cry. Well, my God, don't you think I want to quit? I said, I don't know. I haven't heard you say it yet. And you know something? He never did. He never did say it. I thought, just the same as you are, you're not going to shock me with a shocking machine, man. I know what you're capable of. I know what I'm capable of. And listen, when that happens to one of us, the surest sign that a man hates Jesus Christ is he begins to celebrate. Yeah. Yeah. How they got him. I told you, you know, look there, well, see? That's the devil. And you say people have no business talking like that. You have no business talking like that. I thought I went off to jail, San Quentin. Let me tell you the sequel. He hadn't been to San Quentin, I guess, more than about six months, and I got a letter from a black boy in San Quentin. And it said, Dear Dr. Rookman, <laughs> it said, There's a friend of yours in here. <laughs> and it said, he said that you know the Bible, and he just led me to Christ, and I want to know the Bible, so how about helping me out? I ain't got no money to pay for nothing. <laughs> so I began to send him stuff in the mail, you know. And then about a month later, I picked up the paper, and it said, near riot in San Quentin. He said, today somebody squirted lighter fluid on Charlie Manson. Manson was in there. Charles Manson and set fire him with, with a cigarette lighter, like to burn him to death. Authorities say the trouble came from some kind of a religious discussion. <laughs> I said, got him, got him, got him, got him. <laughs> I mean, that old backslidden preacher in jail that went through that stuff, he was still witnessing. And some of you not even witnessing. Ain't that something? You know what people do? 
They show their hatred for Jesus Christ when they rejoice in the fall of a disciple. Back there in World War II, a young fellow got saved in a meeting, went to the chaplain and wanted to be assistant chaplain. And the fellow let him do a little bit of singing there in the chapel. And he got up there, you know, he said, Boys, I've raised the flag for Jesus Christ, and I put on the uniform of Jesus Christ, and I'm never going to get it dirty. And some of his buddies decided to fix him. And about two weeks later, they got him around the PX and got him drunk. And after they got him drunk, they said, oh, we'll go next Sunday morning to chapel and hear him and see what he's got to say for himself. So the next Sunday morning, those fellows came to chapel, you know, and the kid got up, he's going to sing, and they thought to themselves, boy, we got him now, you know, they're down there punching each other, you know. They, they hate Jesus Christ and winking at each other, you know. And that kid got up there with tears running down his face, and I got something I want to say. And he said, last Saturday night at the PX, I took off the uniform of Jesus Christ, and I lowered the flag, and the devil got me. And he said, but I'm sorry for my sins. I confess my sins, and I'm washed in the blood, and I'm clean. And I've talked to the chap, and he had a prayer with me, and I'm running the flag back up again. And I got up and sang and gave it to him, boy, gave it to him. When I find people rejoicing and saying, well, it deserves him right, just what he got, that kind of stuff, I know what I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with the enemy of Jesus Christ. You said, Brother Ruckman, well, I've done that at times. Well, my dear, beloved brother and sister in Christ, at the point where you did that, at that point, you weren't one of his friends. You hated him without a cause. And the last thing I want to say about this text is this. The last thing I want to say about this text is men show their hate for Jesus Christ by their refusal to have him rule over them. If the truth were known, if you're sitting here tonight and you're still unsaved after all the preaching, admonition, and exhortation, rebuke you've had during this week, there's really only one reason. And it's real simple. Uh, down in your heart, down here underneath, there's a, under this thing right here, there's a, there's a throne in there and there's a cross in there. There's a throne and a cross. And if Christ is not on the throne, He's on the cross. And when you're on the throne... He's on the cross. And when you're on the cross, He's in the throne. And what some of you people won't do, you won't let Christ come in and reign over your life. Yeah. You know, if Carolina men up here, sufficient fellows, paying all your bills and working hard and doing this and that, bragging about a fine fellow you are, maybe you are a fine fellow. Maybe you are. Maybe you're a pretty good fellow. I'll tell you something you won't do. You won't give up the reins of your life and give them to Jesus Christ. You won't. You, you know why? You hate him. Oh, no, brother, if I don't hate him, then why don't you let him, why don't you let him reign over you? Right. Let me ask you, if you, had to, if you had to go to the polls and vote this next time, and what you're going to vote for, I don't know. I got no idea. I mean, uh, I mean you haven't even got the, the evil of two lessers this time. <laughs> Lady out in Texas, she said, Brother Rugg, for the good Lord intended us for a vote, he given us some candidates. <laughs> and I believe that. But you think this, if you had to go to the polls this next time and vote for somebody to run this country who would run your wife, your children, tell you what time to get up, tell you what time to go to bed. I mean, absolute dictator. Tell you what books you could read, what books you couldn't read, whose company you could keep, whose company you couldn't keep, how much you could eat, what kind of, uh, absolute dictator. Who would you vote for? You sure wouldn't vote for Bush or Reagan or Quayle or Gore or some nut like that or Mandela or listen to anybody with any sense if they had to vote for an absolute totalitarian dictator, they'd cast the vote for Jesus Christ. And the fact that you won't get out of your seat and come down here publicly and turn around and tell those folks from now on Christ is running me shows just what you are. And you hate him without a cause. You have no cause to take that position. When I get in the Autobahn in Germany, I turn the car over to Jesus Christ. I don't trust myself to drive. Even here, let alone the Autobahn. <laughs> I mean, you ever drive that thing? That right lane is 70 to 75, and the pass lane is 85 to 100, and the fast lane on the inside. <laughs> and I've seen them at 130 with the bumpers that far apart. 130. You don't realize how fast they're going. You get in that third lane, then hear them going by you on the other side. They're going by. <laughs> you know, they go going oh, down here, they go. Oh, that they go. <laughs> One guy's going 120 this way, other guy at 130. You think I'd trust myself out there? 
What you talking about, man? I get in that car and say, Lord, bless us, get a safe favor, we're going to take it. I can't trust myself. I trust Jesus. Yeah. I get on that plane Monday morning. You think I trust that pilot? You don't know whether he's on dope or beer or whiskey or crack or cocaine or what he's on, man. I don't trust them stewardesses. I don't trust that plane. I first thing I do is get in the plane and say, Lord, I say, Lord, please take all the dams off this plane. Because I've heard them damning it before I got on there. The guys up in the ark take all well, the damn weather and the damn pilot and the damn plane. Which I don't like to get on a damned plane. <laughs> I like to get on a blessed plane. <laughs> so when I get on there, I say, Lord, please take the dam off the weather and take the dam off the seat and take the dam off the pilot and take the dam off the wings. You've got a, a lot of praying. We've got all the dams off. And get the dam off the airport and the dam off the runway and get me home safely. You say, why? Because I'm not capable of running my life. Now, if you're sitting here tonight and you're unsafe, you know what you think? I'll read your mind for you, honey. You think you're capable of running your life. And if you thought you weren't, you'd get right with God tonight. And the fact you won't trust Jesus Christ shows you you think you can run your life better than Jesus Christ can run it. That's what you think. And when I get through, you won't be, your mind won't be changed any. We'll get sick of just saying, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thy bid me come to the old Lamb of God, I come, and you won't come. You know why? You still think you can run it. Well, one of us is wrong. I can't run mine. I give up. I quit. <laughs> I quit. I quit. One time down to south many years ago at an old-time Methodist meeting, old-time Methodist, not this, not this Glide Memorial Fruit Bunch, I mean an old-time Methodist. Down there they had a meeting, you know, a little old Methodist preacher down there about five feet six going up down the line, exhorting the mourners and everything. And back in the building that night there was a colonel there, a real colonel, Confederate colonel, a real thing, you know. And he was back there watching that thing, and he was under terrible conviction. And after a while he came down the aisle, and he stood right here in front of the pulpit like this. You know, like, you know, Lord, if you want to save me, I'll give you a break, you know. <laughs> and that little old Methodist preacher going up down there, you know, talking with the mourners, you know, hang on, let go, you know, and pray through and give up and all this stuff. And he walked by there and to see that colonel standing there. About the fourth time he walked by, he came right up that butt and looked right from his face and said, Say! <laughs> that colonel said, What is it, sir? He said, You know Bill Smith? <laughs> Everybody knew Bill Smith. Bill Smith's an old town drunk in out of jail about ten times a year. And he said, yeah, I know Bill Smith. And he said, well, he's down there in the county jail. And he said, I talked to him this morning. He trusts Christ as Savior. And he said, Bill Smith, his mama was a prostitute, and his daddy was a drunk. He never had the chance of a dog. And he was down on his knees there in the cell praying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And you, sir, had a Christian mother and a Christian father and a Bible in every room, and you ain't got enough decency. Get on your knees before God. You're the meanest man I've met in my life. That old colonel stood there just shaking like a leaf in the wind for about two or three seconds, then he dropped on his knees and said, God be merciful me a sinner. Hey. Now, if you're tonight, you're here on the save, fella, that's your problem. I don't care about your age or experience. I mean, years ago, I was a young man. You know, I had to talk up to some of you folks. <laughs> I don't anymore. I mean, I've got 11 grandchildren. I don't care if you're 50 or 60 or 70 or 80. That's your problem. And you won't get saved until you get, up, get off that rig you're on and say, Lord, I am not capable of running my life. Jesus Christ, you come in and take over and run it for me. Amen. Until that day, you've had it. I know a fellow got saved dreaming a dream one time, and I guess back in the old days, people had more of these dreams than they do now. Several of them converted through dreams. But an old-time preacher got saved through a dream one night. He was about 25 years old. You know what he dreamt? He said he dreamt he saw the picture you're looking at. And he said he dreamt he saw the soldiers whipping Jesus Christ. And he said every time they'd swing those thongs around, he'd hear that thing whistle through the air. And the blood was flying. And the Lord was jerking there at the stake and tied to the stake and jerking back and forth and couldn't get away and tears running down his face and his body bruised and beaten. And he said in that dream, he said, I, I finally had all I could take. And he said in that dream, he said, I walked up to one of those soldiers and tapped him on the back and said, stop it, stop it, for God's sake, stop it. 
And he said, the soldier put down his whip and turned around and looked at me, and he said, I was looking in a mirror. He yeah. said, so I was looking at myself. He said, I've been whipping him. I've been whipping him. Uh, brethren, it's time to put down the whip. Time to put down the whip. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I